Hi, this is your final short lecture on uh, the final concepts and um, uh, of the elements of a, a crime. And so we had actus reus, mens rea, and the unity of those two concepts, and now causation. So causation is not quite as simple as cause and effect. I don't want you really to think about um, someone lit a match and burnt their finger. The cause of the burn is the match. That's not what causation means legally. What the law is trying to look for is did the act, the wrongful act, united with the wrongful state of mind, actually cause the person's or society's harm and in fact cause society's harm. So causation gets complicated when you have acts upon acts, A-C-T-S, acts upon acts. So, for example, in, you know, many car accidents or uh, things where you have people bumping into each other, you have vehicles bumping into each other, you have things tipping over, and um, uh, like a domino effect, you'll have three um, actions in a row, it all started from one bad act, and ultimately somebody gets hurt. So uh, a train is off the train track, and it injures people driving on the road. Or a horse kicks over something, and it uh, ends up knocking over a tower that hurts somebody else. Um, this is the kind of causation that criminal law and law in general is looking for. And we have these things called tests. And these tests were developed over time, and what and really there are questions you want to ask. So in order to determine if a criminal defendant's actions caused a social harm, we ask, did it cause that harm in fact, factually, and, and as we all see it, and as the story is told, did it cause the harm? And also we have to ask a secondary question that says, had the defendant not acted, but for the defendant's activity, this social harm and wrong would never have happened. And those two together eliminate, according to the law, some of these other secondary, ancillary, adjacent things that might have contributed to a social harm or a, a ulti ultimate criminal plaintiff um, harm. So you have, uh, if you think about, this isn't a great criminal act, criminal example, but I'll give you, a, I didn't have time to make up a slide for this, but I'll give you a, a mental picture. Um, there is a wooden boat. It's a classic. And it's stored uh, on somebody's dock on a river. And that boat is wooden and it needs to be cleaned and preserved and one day the boat owner is cleaning with the special cleaner the boat and that owner also had a um, citronella candle to get rid of mosquitoes and the cleaning fluid was flammable and the boat catches on fire and before the boat owner can put it out the boat uh, burns through the ropes holding it to the dock and starts floating down the river and the boat causes other wooden boats to catch fire and wooden docks to catch fire. And then the wooden dock catches fire to a home that's nearby and a camper and a car. And the fire this is in the mountains and the fire department can't get there. And it does not start a wildfire. Uh, the boat continues down the river for miles, still aflame throwing sparks and flames all over the place and causing all this subsequent harm. And so we want to ask our questions. And I'm, I have you on the slide for proximate or intervening causes. Um, you could have this, the secondary boats caught on fire, then float off in another 
branch of the river and catch fly or someplace else. So is the cause in fact of this, this criminal burning, this arson, this um, damage, the boat owner's lighting of the citronella candle, was that, you know, was that, did the person know, or did the cleaning fluid have a notification that this is very flammable, don't use near an open flame? And then our but for test, but for the boat owner's uh, criminal use of the cleaning fluid near an open flame, all this other harm would not have happened. And, um, you know, if, if somebody's property was not in, uh, damaged by the original boat, but was damaged by a second boat that caught fire, is that an intervening cause? Um, and anyway, that's my, my little story. It was actual case in the 1800s. Um, and really kind of understanding what caught, but, but it, that's a civil case. Uh, it's not really a great criminal case. But you can imagine and we can come up with scenarios where there's crowds or multiple bad acts or a defendant in a getaway car is being chased by police. So we have these harms that are intervening and some are dependent on the defendant's conduct and some are independent of it. And so causation is actually a deep, deep concept and must be carefully argued and thought out before the, the district attorney brings the case because for sure a criminal defendant is going to argue that um, there were intervening causes or you can't charge me with that harm, you can only charge me with this harm. And as we continue to go through the course and look at various cases, um, we can see that um, the, the act that led to the prohibited social harm uh, will not be um, interrupted if it also proximately, it, it Within the, prox within, the, within the proximity of that act, other harms um, occurred. It's hard to know if, if how clear that came without uh, seeing your faces and having a, a better slide set of slides for that. But we'll continue to cover causation. If there's any questions, you can definitely ask me. But it's a, it's a deep topic, and uh, lots of scholars write about it, and lots of crim lots of criminal and civil case. Uh, judges write about it as well. Okay, thank you. So that's all of chapter three.